DMS introduction. What is a DMS? What is a data miner system? In this module, we'll take a closer look on what data miner is all about, what the different components are, and what are the different keywords that we need to remember from this session. Basically, how data miner is built up, what we will see in the UI then as well. So in this module, we'll take a closer look at uh, just a general concept of the data miner system. Uh, what is a data miner agent? One specific single node, what can that do? And if you combine several nodes, we have basically a data miner system. So we will see some of the characteristics of those uh, keywords we have here. We have client applications to connect to our data miner system. We'll take a closer look at that together with the additional components. So uh, we have the core data miner system and we have a whole bunch of uh, different components or applications on top of that. And then we, we will take a closer look at some of the keywords that we will need and basically the components that data miner is, uh, is built out, out of. Uh, first of all, we have the data miner drivers. So those are the connectors to tap into the data sources, pull that information into the data miner system, and we typically host those into what we call data miner elements. They can generate alarms as, as well, of course. Um, we organize typically our uh, system with views to keep it organized, and we will take a closer look also at a special case redundancy groups. And finally, we will wrap it up with our service layer, basically combining different elements into one service we are providing in our system. Let's take a closer look at those topics there. So first of all, our data miner system. What is that all about, the data miner concept? Well, as it says here on the screen, uh, it's an end-to-end -end integration of your entire operational ecosystem across any vendor and technology boundary from service origin to destination. A lot of words in one sentence, but it basically means that data miner allows you to tap into any data source you have, whether it's some legacy equipment you have out there, maybe with some serial interfaces, some SNMP equipment, up to cloud environments, uh, other software systems where we can tap into an API. Uh, typically, more and more these days, we have RESTful APIs with JSON, with XML. Uh, so any kind of uh, way we can remotely tap into any data source, we can basically do that with our drivers or connectors, pull that into the data miner system, and start managing your data miner or your complete ecosystem. The nice thing, of course, that is across any vendor and technology boundary. So it doesn't really matter which vendor you choose, today or tomorrow, we give you the guarantee that you can integrate with those choices that you make today or tomorrow. It's specifically designed for our industry, basically end-to-end -end from studio distribution, uh, IPTV, HFC broadband, satellite, fiber, IP, uh, all the way up to uh, customer premises, equipment, setup boxes. Uh, so basically the whole end-to-end -end, uh, is covered with data miner. And that really allows you to have one single pane of glass to manage everything. And that's very convenient because it doesn't, you don't really have to go into all kinds of different systems that have different behavior and different functionality. No, you have all the goodies in one single place, one single pane of glass available. It's an off-the-shelf off solution, but that doesn't really mad, mean that it's a fixed, hard-coded silo. No, it's really an open system. It really allows you to configure and uh, manage your uh, data miner system. Uh, from uh, integrating new equipment, you can create your own drivers, up to creating automation scripts, making visuals. Uh, your system is not a static system, so it really evolves day to day. And you want data miner to, be, to evolve as well. So you can really take the effort yourself and do everything yourself as well. Of course, we are here available as well with our team to manage uh, and help you to uh, further evolve your system as well with our professional services. But it's really uh, something which is uh, also allowing you to work in a DevOps environment uh, with the agility and the uh, flexibility uh, that is really baked into the system uh, with uh, 
easy configuration of alarming, uh, even changing over time. So you can do all those things on the fly without restarting the data miner software. So you can just uh, add new equipment, uh, put new drivers into production, configure new uh, automation scripts, uh, load in new visuals. All of that can be done uh, on the fly. So it's really an open architect architecture where you can integrate all of your stuff you have from legacy equipment up to new uh, state-of-the-art cloud environments. We can all tap into that with our data miner system. So that's one uh, single pane of glass you will have as the end result. And we will further uh, take a closer look at that. That's a little bit of a schematical overview we have here. So in the middle, we have our uh, data miner nodes we have. Uh, they could be hosted in your data center on-prem. They could be hosted into the cloud as well. It doesn't really matter where they are hosted. The only thing we want to be able to do is to connect and tap into the data sources we have southbound. So southbound, we can really uh, go into any kind of uh, system we have there. Uh, as I said, uh, if it's legacy, uh, even could be using like gateways if it's through I.O. contacts or serial ports, we can use uh, industry standard uh, pieces of hardware for gateway uh, purposes, uh, legacy uh, element management systems or vendor specific uh, orchestrators. Um, a DMP is a data miner probe. That's a little bit in a special case, maybe for remote uh, sites, you want to have some uh, standalone probe uh, collecting some uh, local information and then transferring uh, consolidated information to a central system. Um, eastbound, we can uh, integrate with all kinds of um, auxiliary uh, sources like uh, DHCP information, mail, uh, booking CRM, uh, web servers, uh, external uh, data warehousing, uh, things like that. But on the upper uh, side here, you will find our northbound interfacing. Uh, the most important thing we will cover uh, throughout this training is, of course, the data miner clients. Uh, we will be connecting with our data miner cube clients uh, to operate the data miner system. But also we can build portals. Uh, we have a vast amount of APIs available uh, because remember, it's an open system. We make that information available for your uh, other third party uh, developments uh, that you're maybe having and uh, you can easily pull out the information from data miner and use that in your environment. Uh, interfacing with OSS, uh, offloading to third party um, data warehousing, all of these things is available with data miner. So you can see it's really a platform that allows you to uh, pull in any kind of information and to really use it in different environments there. So that's a little bit about uh, what data miner is, what the concept is. Now, if we dive into one single data miner node, a data miner agent, as we call it. So a data miner agent is basically uh, a piece of software running on a Windows operating system. Um, so it's running either on uh, just dedicated hardware or these days, typically, it's mainly running on a virtual machine. Uh, whether that virtual machine is hosted somewhere on your premises or somewhere in the cloud, that doesn't really matter. We just need a Windows operating system. We uh, support any Windows operating system, but we would uh, recommend to use the latest version, which is these days Windows Server uh, 2019. Node also even on a client operating system like um, your uh, Windows 10 uh, on your laptop maybe for uh, maybe development environment, uh, some testing purposes. Uh, you can also actually run it on there. Now, uh, behind the scenes, we typically need to store some data. Um, so we have uh, our alarm history. We have our uh, trend or performance data that we need to store. So we have a lot of data and uh, we need uh, two data sources or data storage uh, environments for that. The first one is Cassandra and the second one is Elastic. Uh, so they are both a little bit different. Uh, Cassandra is uh, mainly used for performance time series uh, data. Elastic is then more for like uh, things like alarms, for instance. Um, so Elastic is uh, now also a requirement in the newer versions of Datamire so that you can easily uh, search your alarms in this indexing uh, engine. Note it's preferably on a separate machine. I'll come back to that in a second. 
Um, older versions of, or uh, we actually still support that, uh, we can also run on uh, MySQL or SQL uh, Server. But we recommend Cassandra and Elastic to leverage all the new features and new goodies we have in data, a data miner, like the AI stuff uh, that is in there. That's only applicable with Cassandra and Elastic. Now, if we would do a remote desktop on a server and open up a task manager, we would basically see a bunch of processes running in the background and they typically start with SL. Uh, so SL data miner, SL element, SL protocol. So there are just a bunch of things on the background uh, doing all the collecting of the information, the processing of the data, the generating of the alarms and performance data, uh, generating the reports, doing the automation, the correlation, all these kind of things are happening uh, within those processes. Now, what, what is an important remark here? That is one data miner agent or data miner node is a fully operational data miner system. It is doing everything you can imagine. So it's going from all the way from collecting the information, the monitoring, the alarming, the performance, the AI, um, up to the orchestration and the automation. Uh, so it has all the functionality in there. So um, basically a data miner agent they are all alike if you have multiple data miner agents. We'll come back to that in a second. Now, uh, a small side note on a data miner agent and more specifically the network arch architecture. Um, this is not a requirement, but it is possible if you take your data miner agent here uh, to connect different networks to it. Uh, you could have one network, uh, network interface to a VLAN, for instance, where your corporate network is where we are with our laptop. And you could also connect, for instance, a completely separate um, uh, network interface to a VLAN or a network we call then an acquisition LAN. Uh, an acquisition LAN, that's more for just pulling the technical network where we go to all the equipment and all the systems uh, to gather the information. Um, Note that uh, we can directly go to the equipment, which is typically the case. Um, if it's as an MP or a TCP IP socket, or mainly these days a web service uh, or web API, we can immediately go uh, to the IP address of the uh, system. Uh, we can also go to other uh, element management systems. But what I was also want to mention here is the gateway. Uh, we do have the possibility to use uh, industry standard pieces of hardware uh, where we go in IP and it does a medium conversion to, for instance, um, serial ports or uh, an uh, IO gateway to IO contacts. If you just have some contact closure some, somewhere um, or a GPIB gateway to spectrum analyzer. So we can leverage those industry standard uh, pieces of hardware uh, to, con to convert from IP to one of those uh, mentioned uh, protocols or uh, mediums. Okay, and uh, now that we discussed one data miner agent doing basically everything, but what is one limitation on a data miner node? That's the compute resources we have. So we do have a limited amount of uh, CPU, memory, threads, uh, disk, all of these kind of things. So at some point when we have a bigger system, we will need to expand that. And that's the nice thing with data miner. You can just add more of those data miner agents or data miner nodes and your system basically grows but it is fully transparent to the user. As a user, I don't really know if I'm connecting to a data miner system with one data miner agent or five or 10 or 20. I don't really know that. I just connect to the system through one of the data miner agents. So I have like uh, five data miner agents on-prem here, and I have a couple of them uh, off-prem in the cloud as well. They just are connected to each other with the TCP IP network and they exchange all the necessary information there. If I connect uh, to the one on the left, or if I connect to the one on the right, doesn't really matter. Through that data miner agent, I enter the complete data miner system, and I see all the elements in my system, all the alarms, all the reporting. I have full access to my complete system through that one single entry point I choose at that point in time, uh, depending maybe on uh, where I am at that point in time. 
Now, if I will configure the data miner system and add new uh, a new driver on there, for instance, or add new equipment or new alarm templates or visuals, I don't really need to worry about the different data miner agents. It is just being added in the data miner system. It automatically distributes into my data miner system. So it really behaves like one system and you just add more data miner nodes as you go and you need more compute resources to handle everything in your data in your environment. So there's no central server, no dedicated uh, clients or anything like that. Um, what I do want to mention here as well, uh, which I will uh, talk about uh, in just a second, is this data miner system will then talk to a Cassandra cluster and an Elastic cluster. So a little bit the same there. You will have multiple nodes to handle the loads that you need for your data miner system for Cassandra and for Elastic. Now, taking a closer look at that Cassandra and Elastic, um, you do have different options there. So first of all, we have the native storage uh, that we mentioned here. And uh, I call it a native storage because it is required for the data miner system. So data miner needs a possibility to get uh, to, to store those history alarms, to store the uh, trend or performance data that we want to activate on certain parameters. So that is a requirement for uh, the data miner system. So uh, these days, both Cassandra and Elastic are required, uh, also Elastic in the newer versions for the alarm indexing. Now, uh, there are three different options mentioned here on how I can uh, choose or which architecture I want to choose. The first one is uh, co-hosted. Uh, that's more for a limited system. I have one, um, let's say my laptop. I have a bare metal, my laptop, and I want to run a data miner agent on there. Well, I can actually just install data miner on there, uh, put Cassandra on there as well, and put Elastic on there, and it will just run fine on my laptop for limited systems. Do note that if I want to grow it a little bit bigger, that Cassandra and Elastic and Datamire, they will require some resources. So um, you could uh, maybe go for a better option where you host them separately. Uh, so you have one virtual machine for Dataminer, you have one virtual machine for Cassandra, and you have one virtual machine for Elastic. That nicely isolates uh, the different um, components from each other so that they are not interfering with memory or CPU or anything like that. Do note whether uh, this is now hosted on one single piece of hardware. So maybe I have one um, bare metal uh, or one piece of uh, hardware and I just put those three virtual machines on there, that's no problem. Or you just uh, spin them up in the cloud, that's no problem. Do note Datamine runs on Windows, Cassandra and Elastic, you can run those on Linux. And it's actually probably recommended to do so as well. Now, if we go beyond uh, a single data miner agent, we would typically look at the separate clusters at the bottom here. Basically, I will uh, make different data miner agents or nodes into a cluster, a data miner cluster, a DMS, as I mentioned before. So I will let that grow to two, three, four, five, six uh, data miner agents as I need. Cassandra, same thing. I will add one, two, three, four, as many nodes as I need to handle the load of my uh, Cassandra data storage. Same thing for Elastic. Do note, I say two nodes here, but it's actually uh, not a recommended environment. Elastic either has one node or three nodes for redundancy purposes. So you should not uh, take a look at this two nodes setup here. We do have on Datamire Dojo a calculator where you can um, take a closer look on if I have so many elements, so many trending, so many alarming, what is a recommended setup? Uh, that's something you can check out on uh, Datamire Dojo, uh, our community website you can find on dataminer.services. Now, um, next to the native storage, which we require for op uh, a Datamire operation, is uh, also external offloading and that's optional and I want to stress optional you don't require it dataminer doesn't require, require it and dataminer doesn't even benefit from it it will never retrieve information from that it's just 
offloading it, uh, storing the information you want onto some external data source, uh, data uh, storage. Uh, we can offload to MySQL, SQL Server, uh, Oracle, or you can also go for file offload. We dump it into files and you can process it with scripting and uh, basically forward that to any data warehouse of your choice. That could be alarming, that could be trending performance data. So you configure it, you choose it, uh, it's being offloaded there and nothing further happens with that. Uh, a small technical detail maybe is that um, if we store information in our own native storage, it will typically be with uh, all kinds of internal IDs, an element ID, a parameter ID, um, so that whenever you rename your device uh, or your element, uh, that's, that's immediately uh, applicable inside the database as well. When we do offloading, we will do a translation immediately for you into the human readable name of your element and no longer use some kind of internal ID because that would not say anything to you in the offloads. That as a small side note. Okay, so we took a look at uh, a data miner agent, adding multiple data miner agents into a cluster and also adding some storage uh, to that. Now, once we've built our uh, data miner system and it's uh, talking to all, uh, my, all, all of my ecosystem here, uh, we will uh, need to connect and uh, get some information out of it. And that happens on the northbound. So we will mainly take a look at the data miner cube interface. Uh, so that will be our main interface we will use throughout this training because it's the most feature rich and we need some of those uh, features to also administer uh, administ in the administrator part to add new things to the data miner system and things like that. Um, so that's typically being used in as uh, for NOC operators as well. So it's a desktop application, you have it installed, it's like your Outlook you have open. You do also have an HTML5 uh, version, uh, that's a more lightweight uh, version, so uh, that's a little bit easier ad hoc access, whether you take any device, a uh, tablet or a phone, or uh, you're somewhere on an, uh, another computer that is not yours, uh, so you can quickly open up a web browser and navigate to the monitoring, the ticketing, the reporting, etc. We do also now have these days the possibility to connect your data miner system to our data miner services uh, cloud platform. So the data miner cloud platform allows you to uh, provide access to third parties like uh, with sharing a dashboard, for instance, or to easily hook into our uh, catalog with new drivers. All those kind of things uh, will allow you to uh, more easily uh, hook into the clouds and share and use those cloud services there. Now, uh, we will focus, as I said, mainly on the data miner cube interface. But before we will do so, I will uh, now talk a little bit, not too much, about uh, the additional components mentioned here on the right hand side. Let me remove my uh, screen uh, for a second so that you see all of them. Uh, so uh, I will briefly discuss the discuss those components because not all of them uh, are being covered in uh, this training here. Uh, and I want to mention what they are. Um, so you can still get back to us or uh, uh, look up some more information in the help. But um, I just want to briefly mention uh, what they are. Um, mobile gateway, mobile gateway, uh, very quick, it's just the possibility to hook uh, up a mobile uh, phone um, and allows you to send text messages or even receive text messages. Uh, so when, when somebody is on duty and he should receive the critical alarms of the data miner system, but he's not always uh, uh, online, you can send them text messages so that he wakes up in the middle of the night, for instance. Um, you can also send text messages. People on the road can send a quick text message to do certain actions on your data miner system as well. The correlation and the automation. Um, so correlation is detecting a certain condition in your data miner system that you want to act upon. So 
whether it's like, okay, my device A uh, fails and my device B is also on a certain uh, condition, like switched towards uh, device A, I want to pick up that condition and I want to do certain action to fix the problem, for instance. Um, also interesting with the correlation is that it allows you not only to uh, detect certain conditions and react on it, but also make it easier for the operator to group alarms together. Uh, so if you have uh, an alarm storm happening and a whole bunch of things are going into alarm, you have the possibility to group them and to basically uh, do root cause analysis and uh, also make it more meaningful for the operator to have one single outage alarm instead of having 100 device alarms, you could say. The automation is uh, really more about uh, scripting and automating certain actions in your data miner system. So you don't want operators uh, to have a piece of paper with all the different steps that they want to execute. No, you take that, you put it in an auto automation script, they just click on a single button and it automatically executes the whole procedure without any room for error. Um, that's just manually triggered um, by clicking on a button. It could also be schedule basis, uh, based. For instance, every morning or uh, every evening at eight o'clock, uh, a channel is uh, go coming up. So I want to reconfigure certain things in my data miner system or change alarm templates, things like that. And it could also be event-based. Um, so the correlation engine detecting something and the automation automatically kicking in to resolve that. We will also see with uh, SRM uh, could even be with bookings. Now, reports, dashboards, and spectrum analysis. Uh, reports and dashboards is really more about uh, making more uh, gr nice graphical uh, ways of representing the data. Uh, more with bar charts, uh, pie charts, uh, uh, line uh, graphs, um, more, but also more tabular uh, information and um, key performance indicators that you want to visualize. And you, com you basically combine all of these components onto uh, what we call a dashboard. Uh, you create a blank page, you put all the metrics on there, and then you can easily share that with somebody who's not really that familiar with uh, data miner, or you want to show it uh, on a screen on the network operation uh, center uh, at the front, or uh, maybe somewhere in the hallway or just share it through the data miner cloud services uh, with an external party. Um, they can also be sent through email uh, and that's also uh, very nice. Uh, for instance, every Monday morning that I receive a nice report uh, of how my system have, has been doing uh, in the last 24 hours or the last week. Spectrum analysis, uh, that's more for integrating with spectrum analyzers. Um, not sure if that's uh, applicable to you, but if you have spectrum analyzers, uh, we can uh, talk to the spectrum analyzer and basically continuously 24 seven get spectrum traces, maybe uh, even out of different measurement points with uh, like uh, a switch also uh, attached to it so that we can continuously get the traces out of uh, the different measurement points and do monitoring, generating alarms whenever a signal uh, disappear somewhere um, and it's also multi-user uh, so uh, you can work with two people on the same spectrum analyzer and get your own traces get your own view uh, so it will share the resources then and get a trace for you and for you uh, one after the other so that's also uh, very powerful and useful um, if you have spectrum analyzers the business uh, layer that you can add on top of your data miner system well, I said with the drivers, we ingest the information and we host that in our elements, in our uh, equipment, devices, systems we manage and we gather in our data miner system. We can combine several of those um, elements or parts of the elements into a service layer. I'll come back to the service layer uh, later on in this session. And we can also then add a business layer on top of that to track the availability of my services, meaning that at the end of the month, uh, how did I do? Uh, what's my uptime? Is it 99.99 or 998? Or 
I want to track that availability. How many outages did I have? When did I have the outages? What were the details of those outages? So the SLAs or service level agreements that I add on top of my data miner system allows you to track the availability of the services that you deliver through your system. The SRM uh, and uh, service and resource management is uh, adding another layer on top of your uh, automation correlation with uh, service and resource management, allowing you to basically manage resources, uh, first of all, in your data miner system. Um, and then I can book those resources and say like tonight at eight o'clock, I have uh, some uh, booking of, uh, let's say, uh, a fiber link that I need to a sports stadium. So I will book the necessary equipment and the necessary services, cloud services, functions that I have in my data miner system so that tonight at eight o'clock, I will have those available. If somebody else wants to do a booking at eight o'clock tonight, those will no longer be available, but I will have, of course, uh, more resources. But you get the, 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 the sense of it. It basically keeps track of when a certain resource is being used by whom, and so to avoid double booking. Now, uh, when it's eight o'clock tonight, we will basically in the data miner system fully orchestrate the whole setup. So we will automatically uh, take the necessary resources, load profiles on there, as we call it. So profiles are basically a set of uh, parameters like uh, for uh, what's my audio bitrate or video bitrate or uh, what's my symbol rate or all kinds of settings you can configure in the profiles. We load the, conf uh, the chosen profiles onto all the necessary components of the whole uh, service that we want to, want to build, basically allowing you to build fully automated service. So tonight at eight o'clock, uh, maybe with a pre-roll, it will configure everything and I can do and start the transmission when the time is there. At um, a few hours later, uh, 10 o'clock, maybe uh, I've finished my booking and then it will nicely uh, destruct everything and everything will be freed up again. So that's the service and the resource management uh, to fully orchestrate uh, these kind of environments with uh, bookings. The ticketing uh, allows you to uh, integrate uh, with uh, ticketing. Um, we do have a full ticketing module in DataMiner, and it also allows you to uh, integrate with third-party ticketing systems. Um, so uh, if you don't have a third-party ticketing system, you can definitely take a look at our ticketing uh, module that we have. If you already have a ticketing system, we can integrate with the existing one. But the advantage of having also the native ticketing in data miner is that it really keeps track of uh, all those ticketing uh, uh, hooks and links into the data miner natively. Uh, so I can just right click on an alarm. I can immediately uh, link it to a ticket, uh, these kind of things. It has a uh, separate web interface. Uh, so you do have the possibility to provide access uh, to other people to, uh, to that ticketing module only, not the full complexity of data miner, only the ticketing, you can uh, give that to some uh, uh, teams of your environment. Now, jobs is uh, about um, allowing you to ingest uh, bookings uh, because uh, a booking does need some details. Um, I mean, we need to have the necessary resources, profiles. So sometimes there's some technicalities that are not really known yet at the beginning. So a job is really about uh, ingesting, uh, like you could say, a task, a job. Uh, something will need to happen like tonight at eight o'clock. I had that um, fiber link that I wanted to a sports stadium. Uh, so I only want, uh, I only know uh, that it's currently, it's tonight and it's uh, at sports stadium X. And that's about it. Uh, that's, that's all I know. So that's really uh, more of a front end, uh, an easy one where we ingest uh, the jobs. Once the jobs are in, we can convert them into real bookings where we assign the necessary resources and profiles and service definitions. Without going into too much details, uh, that's a quick overview of the SRM and jobs. Now the um, CPE, um, the inventory and asset management and apps we have uh, still left there. CPE is a, a little bit in a, in a special environment because here we are talking not about 
typically high speed polling of um, high end environments, but we're talking more about uh, millions uh, of devices, uh, literally millions of devices, where we have sometimes a little bit uh, more slower uh, round robin polling or multi-threaded every 15 minutes or uh, could still be streamed uh, and uh, still be uh, uh, pushed to the data miner system. But if we pull information, it's uh, typically a little bit slower. And typically in these environments, it is possible, but typically in these environments, we're not doing any alarming on, or monitoring on, on the end uh, devices uh, or equipment because if we have millions of setup boxes or, or cable modems or satellite terminals, if, if one goes down, we typically don't generate an alarm yet. Um, it's typically more if uh, a whole series of them are generating an alarm because then maybe you have a problem at a certain level in your network. And that's what we do in a CPE environment. We add a whole topology uh, of your uh, infrastructure in there that you basically have different layers in there and we have a bunch of CPE or EPM devices that are hooked into a specific uh, comp uh, layer or uh, level and that bubbles up into the system. Um, so whether it's uh, like an uh, OT, uh, OTT client that is uh, uh, con uh, looking at a specific channel or if it's a setup box that is uh, in a specific uh, node, uh, it doesn't really matter. We can basically bubble up the metrics in that specific area of your topology structure. Uh, so there we typically focus on alarming on the higher levels, you could say, and uh, taking a look at averages of the, me the measurements that we have of the different um, lower level uh, layers. The data miner uh, inventory and asset management component, um, that one allows you to integrate with a uh, database uh, or a uh, asset management uh, system, allowing you to automatically populate the data miner system with uh, the inventory you have. So if new uh, equipment or uh, new systems are being added in your data miner system um, or in your uh, environment. They are typically uh, provisioned in your uh, inventory and Datamark can basically detect that, immediately read that out and add also uh, uh, the necessary components in the data miner system and add an element immediately polling the equipment, maybe even uh, immediately starting to uh, configure it uh, where needed. But also the other way around, once we start polling the device and we get, for instance, the uh, firmware or software version from the uh, system, we can push that back uh, to the inventory uh, and asset management system so that your inventory system uh, is always uh, up to date with the latest information coming immediately from your network. And the last final one is the uh, data miner apps. Uh, the apps is uh, more um, uh, components we can add on the data miner system uh, specifically for more uh, one vendor or technology environment. Um, could be a specific one for uh, a vendor, but also more like uh, for an IP network. Uh, if I have an IP network, uh, it immediately scans it. Uh, it will have the possibility to, to have a nice graphical overview of my uh, different routers and switches where you can see all the connections and things like that. So it makes it a lot easier to um, immediately have off the shelf uh, a fully configured uh, system for specific environments. Now, uh, you can find more information on uh, the different apps uh, on Dataminer Dojo as well. Uh, so on dataminer.services, uh, you have our community website where you can find all kinds of use cases and uh, more uh, documentation and information on uh, all those different apps and modules you can add on top of that. So I just briefly wanted to mention uh, a couple of them, uh, just briefly, as I said, because uh, we're not go going to go into those details. Um, we are here to get uh, started with the basics of the data miner system uh, to start uh, navigating around a little bit. And uh, here I just wanted to mention there's a lot more than what we will discover in this uh, course. Um, you can go way further than uh, all of this. So uh, just keep that in the back of your mind. If some of those things uh, are uh, of interest for you, you can definitely find inf more information uh, on Datamire Dojo. 
Now, what we will do is um, uh, for the rest of this uh, video is uh, go through a couple of keywords um, or components or things that build up the data miner system. Um, so that's drivers, elements, views, redundancy groups, service layers. So basically uh, we're going to build that up a little bit. Those are the, the, the keywords that will come back in the data miner uh, cube interface uh, as well. So the first thing I want to uh, briefly uh, mention, uh, because uh, that's an important one. It's one of the cornerstones of a data miner system. Data miner needs to be able to talk to all those data sources and pull in that information. How is that being done? Well, it's done through our data miner drivers, or we also call them protocols in uh, the user interface. It's basically an XML document. You can see it on the right hand side. Uh, so you can open it up, you can read it. Um, uh, typically, uh, we uh, develop those uh, drivers in uh, Visual Studio. Um, we have DIS, that's Data Miner Integration Studio. That's a plugin for Visual Studio to easily create uh, these kind of drivers. Um, it shows you XML um, with all kinds of parameters, the data display, for instance, the layout of, of how the, 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 the metrics that are coming back from the equipment are going to be visualized. That's all stored into that XML. But with DIS, you have like a, a display editor. I can just drag and drop your layouts, your parameters around. Uh, so that makes it very convenient. Um, so um, not all of that is just written in text. And note also, we do it in Visual Studio because next to the uh, XML, we also have C Sharp we can add in there to process the information and the data coming back from the uh, equipment or to do more advanced stuff as well. And the Visual Studio allows us to actually uh, do debugging as well and uh, step through debugging. Uh, all of these goodies are available in uh, DIS uh, when you are uh, into developing uh, of drivers. There's also some great courses on that on Datamar Dojo as well, if you are interested in uh, developing your own drivers. Because as I mentioned, DataMire, it's an open system. Uh, you can develop those drivers as well. If you have an easy SNMP thing, uh, the device there with a couple of parameters, that's actually quite easy. You take the MIB, the, the, the management and information, uh, information base uh, from uh, SNMP from that device. Uh, you can just import that into DIS, pick a couple of parameters, uh, put it in a timer so that you define how often data miner needs to uh, retrieve that information and you have a driver. So what's in a driver is how data miner can communicate with the equipment, if it's SNMP or if it's a web API, uh, JSON, uh, XML, whatever. Um, we pull that information in, we break it up and we show it somewhere on the user interface into what we call parameters. Uh, so the, the layout is in there as well, uh, but very important also is uh, the polling uh, mechanism. Um, because uh, things like uh, a signal level or an EPNO or a bit trade, is, those are important parameters and we, we want them to be polled quite often, while other parameters like um, a firmware version or uh, the name of the device, that's hardly going to change. So we only pull that once in a while. So we definitely want to make sure that we use uh, the polling capacity that we have towards one device, which is typically not uh, a resource problem of data miner, but uh, of the device itself. Uh, we have to be careful not over polling the device as well, of course, uh, to, to use uh, that capacity we have to get the most valuable information and to get the refresh rate as good as possible on the most important uh, information. Now, um, there is also multiple versions. We'll come back to uh, versioning uh, later on in the administrator uh, as well. But uh, be aware that we have uh, new versions that we can make available of drivers. So you can test the version and if you're happy, you can put it in production on all your, you can easily go back and things like that. So there is a whole versioning mechanism uh, behind drivers as well. But uh, you you get the hang of it a little bit. It's uh, a driver, it's an, it, it's an open uh, XML uh, formatted document. Uh, you can create one in Visual Studio with DataMire Integration Studio, and it allows us to get that information of all those data sources in DataMiner. And that's really any information. Now, um, a, a small note is a driver. Okay, yeah, there's, there's a lot of information in there and it allows you to pull information uh, from, from serial devices up to cloud environments, but 
all those parameters that are there, um, I want to do something with it. I want to define when it's an alarm or um, maybe I want to tweak certain things or a name to it. Uh, I want to define where the trend, uh, trend or performance data needs to be stored on which parameters. Well, therefore, we are using what we call overlay files or um, templates. Uh, so the, the driver is an XML driver and you can basically create your own templates with your own definition for certain things like alarming, like trending, like more information, like naming and things like that. And you can put that on top of uh, the existing driver that we provide uh, or that the a developer at your uh, company uh, created. The objective is that uh, you never have to touch a driver to just do configuration if you want to change alarm limits and things like that. Um, so you can just uh, pick and choose and uh, have an existing alarm templates put on top of an XML driver. Whenever there's a new version of the, the protocol, uh, you can just reuse that uh, template you had created uh, before. Uh, so we have five templates in this case. So you can choose uh, which ones are being used for which elements, or maybe over time they can change. So there again, you have uh, quite some flexibility, uh, which we will discover also more in administrator parts. So that's for drivers. Um, when we get that information in uh, in the data miner system and we have it in elements, we do have some alarms we can have and the alarm levels that we have available are normal, no alarm basically. Warning, minor, major, critical. The default colors, and I mentioned the default colors because you can actually uh, change that. Uh, the administrator can change that on a data miner system in a config file. But the default colors are uh, blue, uh, cyan, yellow, and red. And note, you don't have to use all of those uh, levels. Eh? If you say like, okay, I'm not really interested in uh, minor alarms, you don't configure anything there and you only have warning, major and critical alarms. So that's up to you. But those are the colors you will find in a de default data miner system, the warning, minor, major, critical. Now to configure um, our thresholds, um, we basically have two different uh, styles of parameters or um, different types of parameters. And that's what we call a discrete parameter and an analog parameter. A discrete parameter is like an on-off. Um, the fan is on or off. The signal lock status is locked or unlocked or maybe even unknown. So you define that lock on uh, the signal lock. If it's locked, that's good. If it's unlocked, it's a critical uh, situation. For analogs, uh, you basically have a number that can range uh, like uh, a CPU utilization from uh, 0 to 100%, so it has a fixed range, or it could be a bit rate uh, with, a, with a wider range, or an, an output level in this case. Um, there we define thresholds. Uh, we say that around 7 is normal, can be a little bit higher, but if it goes uh, 12 or higher, then it's a minor. Uh, and if it goes beyond 15, then we have a critical. Note, we didn't use the warning uh, here and the, the major here, but we did use the warning on the low side. And you notice we have a critical low and a critical high. So there's a small distinction there. Here, we only have a critical alarm on the signal lock because uh, it can only go into alarm. But here we actually have a, a small distinction between a critical alarm on the high side or the low side of the output level. Okay, so um, the threshold that you define 15, whenever it's 15 or higher, it goes into critical. If it's 12 or higher or on the lower side, the same thing. So that's the alarming and we define those alarm um, thresholds in uh, the alarm template. You can uh, find a, a small screenshot uh, here at the bottom of this screen. But what I want to uh, just uh, emphasize here is just a small tip, a small side note, but alarming is very important. Uh, it is important to make sure that you pick up on the necessary alarms so that you define uh, those thresholds correctly, but also that you're not um, putting your alarm thresholds too loosely or too, too, too wide because then you're going to generate way too many alarms 
and uh, people will just be annoyed by by having a system with thousands of alarms and and hardly be able to find and pinpoint the real alarms so it is a continuous effort, uh, to be honest, uh, because you need to continuously question like, okay, this alarm, should I improve it? Should I add uh, uh, maybe other techniques to it, like threshold or hysteresis? I'll come back to that. Or uh, define uh, different thresholds. So keep that in mind that you continuously uh, evolve and uh, improve your alarm thresholds so that you're not generating too many alarms and that the correct alarmings uh, are getting uh, through to the people. Two special alarms. Um, next to the regular alarms, we have uh, information alarms and uh, timeouts. Information alarms, um, it's here in the UI, typically it's on a different tab page in the information uh, tab page. Uh, but here you can see a uh, new information alarm uh, here because it's gray. So the information is gray. The information alarms, uh, it's uh, just more all the trailing things that are happening in your system. In this case, uh, somebody connected, a new client uh, connected to the data miner system. Um, but also not only connecting to the data miner system, but also doing certain configuration on the data miner system itself, like uh, changing an alarm template or doing configuration on the, the equipment or the devices or systems we're managing. If you're doing a set or you're changing an admin state of a port, for instance, on a Cisco switch, it will immediately generate uh, an uh, information event saying this person changed this parameter at that point in time. So you can always go back uh, to the history and say like last week uh, on Tuesday, who was changing there uh, some settings on this specific device. That's all being tracked automatically in the data miner system. Next to the information events, we also have timeout. We do have a timeout at the bottom here. The communication state not responding. So we have a specific device that is no longer uh, responding. So we send a command and we don't get back anything back. Is the device down or not? We cannot tell because we send something, we don't get it back. Maybe there's a network interruption. Maybe the device is still um, fully operational, but maybe there's a network problem in between data miner and the device. Or it could be that the device really died and it's dead. So that's a major problem. So we don't really know. It doesn't reply. It doesn't. Uh, come back to us with more information. So that's indicated with an orange alarm, a timeout alarm. The, as I mentioned before, we, we have our templates. Um, so on top of the protocols that define how to communicate with a specific system or a data source, we can define our templates or um, in this case, alarm thresholds. So the alarm thresholds that I define, I define them in a so-called template. If I have um, a specific type of device, I could create 10 different alarm templates and maybe the ones that are in, uh, in, in site one will be using templates A and the ones that are in site B are using template B or maybe over time they are changing. So you define, depending on certain conditions, you can define like, okay, these devices are using, or these elements are using template A, these are using template B. And you can change that over time. Um, so you can easily change that, but note that there is also a possibility, a little bit more advanced for uh, at this point in time, but you can also group templates on top of each other. So you could have base templates with, with all the, 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 the foundation of the alarms, the general stuff, and then have uh, something special more for like, oh yeah, this device is being used in an HD environment. So though that's a, an, an overlay template for HD. And we have an environment here with 4K. Uh, so that's a different uh, overlay template because those bit rates will be a little bit higher uh, on that. Uh, stream that is passing by here. So the base is the same, like uh, power supply, uh, temperature, things like that. Uh, that's the same, uh, but you could have different overlays. Uh, that's as a side note. So uh, but what I briefly want to mention here is it's not because you have two 
devices or elements of the same type uh, to Cisco switches, for instance, that you will effectively always see the alarm threshold, uh, the same alarm thresholds in there. It depends on the configuration. Another small side note that I want to mention because that could be confusing in the UI um, is hysteresis. Uh, what's hysteresis? That's a delay. We can configure a delay on an alarm. Let's take a look at an example. Um, we have a signal level here and the signal level is going down and up over time. So it's evolving over time as the time uh, passes by. So um, we defined a certain threshold here uh, in red, indicated in red, that's my threshold. So currently uh, in the beginning uh, phase here, uh, my signal level is in a normal state. It's perfectly normal, so there's no problem. Um, but suddenly it starts, it starts to increase. So as soon as I hit the threshold, uh, we generate an alarm and it goes into a critical state. So we have a critical situation. My um, signal level is too high. Now, over time, it uh, goes down a little bit again and it goes below my threshold. Normally, at this point in time, under normal uh, conditions and normal alarm uh, thresholds, the alarm would disappear. But I can say I want to delay the clearing here. And I want to say like, OK, but if it just clears for a couple of seconds, I don't want it to be cleared because sometimes it's tolling a little bit. Um, I only want to clear it after 10 seconds or 30 seconds or maybe one minute or maybe two minutes. So if it's only for a few seconds uh, normal again and it comes back, we never cleared the alarm. It remains in my system. It goes again uh, below my uh, threshold. So normally it would immediately clear, but we configured, let's say, a 10 second delay. So it will wait 10 seconds and if after 10 seconds, my uh, value, the uh, signal level is still in a good shape, then we will clear the alarm. So 10 seconds later, we clear the alarm and my situation is normal again on this parameter. So hysteresis is very important to allow uh, to avoid toggling of alarms. And if you have something like alarm, no alarm, alarm, no alarm, you can avoid that with this uh, setting. In this case, we used a delay on the clearing because if the signal level goes bad, we immediately see the alarm. So as soon as it's bad, we have the alarm, we can immediately react on it. But if it clears, it needs to remain good for 10 seconds, 30 seconds, then we clear the alarm and data miner. You could also have it the other way around because here with, with signal level, that's perfectly fine and that's working well. My signal level is going bad. I immediately have a, a, an alarm. If it goes good again, we need to make sure that it's good before we clear the alarm. But you could also delay the alarm generation. So we have basically a clear hysteresis that I just, or off hysteresis that I just discussed. We also have an on hysteresis. Let me give you an example of that. And that's for instance, the CPU utilization of a server um, or any device um, as a matter of speaking. So if my CPU utilization goes to 100%, actually that's not really a problem. If it's only there for, I don't know, like, 10, 20 seconds. I mean, the CPU is there to be used. So if something needs to be loaded in or configured, you can use the full capacity of the CPU. Uh, you can go for 100% CPU utilization uh, for a while to process that uh, heavy load that is coming in. But I expect it to go down again. And that's where um, the uh, alarm or on hysteresis comes in. I can say whenever it goes above 90% I want to generate an alarm, but not immediately. I want to delay it, let's say for five minutes. And if my CPU goes above 90% and a minute later it goes uh, below 90% uh, again, no problem, nothing happens. Uh, it was just doing its job. But if it goes to 100% uh, and it stays there and it 
it keeps on staying there. And then after a few minutes, maybe two, three, five minutes, I say like, okay, now I want to generate an alarm because that's a, not a normal situation that it remains that high for a, that long of a period. So you see, it depends a little bit on the type of parameter, uh, on whether you can uh, use the on hysteresis or the off hysteresis, the delaying on the clear or the delaying on the alarm generation. But um, I definitely wanted to mention it uh, at this stage because um, it is possible that you open up uh, a device or an element in data miner at this point in time, or maybe even at this point in time here, your parameter looks normal. Uh, the value, the, the, the signal level is perfectly okay, but still we have a critical alarm on there. Then yeah, wait a little bit, the alarm might clear because there is a hysteresis still uh, configured on this uh, specific parameter. So uh, that's why uh, I, want def I want to definitely mention it uh, at this stage. So all the data is coming in, all the parameters, we have all the metrics uh, in there, um, and then uh, we basically have our elements, our uh, devices, systems, uh, we are managing the data sources, we represent them in data miner as so-called elements. So an element is represented with a small uh, cube icon, uh, you could say a rectangle, and it has in front of it a small indication. This small indication uh, represents the most severe alarm state. So if I have five warnings and one critical, my device is in a critical alarm state. Critical, major, minor, warning, um, and uh, the normal state. So I hope uh, most of my devices or elements are in normal state. There are no active alarms, nothing to worry about. Everything is okay. If there is no alarm indication, well, maybe you're just pulling the equipment and you're uh, keeping track of some uh, trend performance data over time, like a bit rate, you want to generate some graphs and things like that, but you're not really um, generating alarms because you didn't define any thresholds. Uh, so it's perfectly possible to have uh, elements in your data miner system without any alarming activated on there. Then there will be no indication because we cannot really tell if it's good or bad. Uh, there is no monitoring defined on it. So no thresholds are set. Um, the timeout is uh, with the orange color, as you might remember from a few, few slides back. Um, this is now here indicated with an orange cross uh, also basically visualizing like, okay, there's no uh, communication anymore. We're not able to talk to the uh, data source anymore. So that's the timeout indication. You have the paused and uh, the stopped. I'll come back to that. And the purple, that's a special color we didn't see yet. You can uh, change that color as well if you want to. Uh, the default uh, color purple uh, that's being used for masked. Uh, masking of uh, elements that's basically suppressing the alarms they are working on it you know there are some alarms on there but that ex that is expected you don't want other people to worry about it then you can just mask it suppress it and then we say like don't worry about that they exist they are still being tracked uh, i can still go back to them in the uh, history but uh, we are no longer worried uh, about them or that's at least the signal i want to give to my uh, colleagues now the uh, active post stopped so uh, go back so we have a post sign that can um, be indicated in front of my elements and you have a stop sign uh, just in the rectangle in front of my elements that can be um, indicated so uh, an element in the data miner system has three states uh, we typically expect them to be active but you can also pause them and stop them what's the difference well, let's take a look at that um, here on the right hand side. So we have our data miner agents and it has three different elements on there. Element one, element two, element three, and the first is active, this one is paused, this one is stopped. Now um, we do have our yeah, virtual IP layer. That's basically uh, our web interface or our client uh, where we can access the information uh, in the client. The physical layer, that's uh, our real data source, our real device or um, our, uh, software package we're uh, pulling the information from. 
Uh, in the first case, we're effectively polling, or it is pushing, it depends on the protocol, uh, the information to data miner, and data miner represents that into the UI. So this is active. Everything is fully functional. Uh, everything is working fine. If I pause an element, you basically pause the communication towards the data source. Uh, everything is still fully operational and you can still access all the last measurements. Everything is still in memory and ready to be immediately starting uh, to uh, communicate with the device and starting the polling again. But you just stop that polling for a while. Maybe you have to do some rewiring, you pause it, you do some rewiring and you can activate it again. You didn't generate a timeout alarm. If you would pull out the IP cable here while the element is active, it would generate a timeout alarm. People would start to worry. So here you just pause it, you pull out the cable, um, maybe you, you, you swapped with a new device, um, you uh, activate it again and nothing happens. The element just briefly stopped the polling uh, or paused the polling, I should say. Now, what's the big difference with po uh, stopping? Uh, stopping also stops uh, the pauses, the uh, polling, you could say, but um, it's, well, it's, it's still in my uh, user interface, of course, but uh, it really destructs everything uh, out of memory as well. Uh, so it will uh, take away everything data mine knows about the elements, the last measurements, it will throw that away. Uh, it, it, nothing is uh, further in memory. If I would start this element again and make it active or paused, it would need to load in uh, the parameters and the measurements and everything and start the whole protocol driver structure again into memory. So it might take uh, a few seconds, you could say, uh, to load that in again, depending on the size of the protocol. So typically you do that uh, more for like, uh, let's say if you need to uh, ship the device back uh, to the manufacturer or uh, it, this will be reconfigured uh, in, in the cloud and it will be down for, for a week, uh, then you would typically uh, stop the element. Uh, you, you, you no longer worry about it uh, for a, a longer period of time, but you still have all the configuration left. You can pick it up and start it immediately at any point in time. Of course, all the alarm history and trending, that's still there. Eh? That's uh, all the configuration is still there. It's just the real time uh, stuff that is taken out of memory for a moment. So typically it's all active paused, just stopping the communication uh, for a few minutes or, or maybe a few hours. Uh, stopping is typically, uh, it's no longer consuming any memory and resources in the data miner system because we take it out of memory and we just uh, um, leave all the configuration um, just on disk, you could say. Active paused stopped. Now, um, just a small side note, a small tip, when you configure a data miner system, think about naming convention. Um, especially if you're working with uh, multiple data miner administrators and multiple people are uh, adding uh, elements to the system and even views, as, as we will immediately see, think about uh, naming convention, that it's consistent, uh, that uh, you do have maybe some kind of uh, thought through structure of, of location, the type of, of uh, device or, uh, um, or system. These kind of things you could embed with maybe underscores or spaces in between there. Um, uh, how do you indicate if it's a backup or a main? Um, try to think about some kind of naming conventions. There are a few things here on the slide you can uh, use as, as uh, a little bit inspiration, you could say. But uh, before you start configuring everything, uh, think about naming convention as a side note. Now, um, a couple of special uh, data miner elements. Um, they are a little bit more a special case. Um, first of all, virtual elements, then combined with a hidden element and then an application of it. Um, we do have an element one here um, that is uh, represented in my UI. Um, it is existing on the data miner agent, of course, and it's getting the information from uh, the effective data source. Um, we do have a, a second element as well, exactly the same thing. And we do have a third element here, which is pulling out information, but it's actually not visualized here. That's my next uh, item, that's a hidden element. But here, the fourth element, 
that I see in my system has also, of course, the data miner uh, representation, but it doesn't really have something um, out in my network where it gets the information from. There's no data source, there's no device, there's no system, there's no piece of software or API where it gets the information from. Well, actually, where does it get the information from? Well, it gets it from other elements in my data miner system. So we are able to create so-called virtual elements. They are virtual, they are a virtual representation, and they are getting the information from other pieces in uh, my data miner system. So that's what we call a uh, virtual element. So the fourth element here is a virtual. It does really have the actual uh, data source out in my network. The hidden element, as I mentioned, that's element three. There is uh, no graphical presentation here in the virtual IP layer. It won't be shown in my, um, well, it will be shown in my UI. I still need to be able to configure it, but it won't be shown in my uh, default uh, surveyor tree structure because, uh, or in my default element list, I will need to take a little bit a next step to show the hidden elements as well. So by default, you don't really see it. Um, Typically, we do that um, for um, devices that are not really for you, uh, useful for, for operating them. And an example for that is um, an I.O. gateway. Um, so we do have at the, the bottom there, um, we do have a device with um, I.O. contacts. Um, the I.O. contacts are actually wired up to what we call an I.O. gateway. So that's a device measuring the, the contacts. We need to pull in the, the status or the, the, the contact um, status. Uh, we do that with a device pulling that specific I.O. gateway in this case. But this I.O. gateway will only show you uh, contact one, open, close, contact two, open, close, etc. for like, I don't know, 16, 32 uh, contacts. It doesn't, doesn't mean anything. Um, so typically we, we can just set that as a hidden element uh, because it's not useful. But what we, will, what we will do is we will take maybe two contacts of that IO gateway and we will put it in a virtual element and the virtual element will then represent, uh, could be like an, uh, an, an air conditioning or could be an uh, HPA or uh, some, something with just contact closures, uh, a device with not too much of a smart uh, interface, but just contact closures. And we can say like, okay, my HPA, it's uh, okay or it's not okay, or the alarm status is okay, not okay. Very simple, um, but it shows me what it is. Uh, is it the alarm status? Is it the transmit that is uh, yes or no, or transmitting or not? So I can make those dummy or uh, contacts from the IO gateway, give it a more meaningful name in that virtual layer. And that's something that the operator uh, might uh, be interested in, not uh, contact one, two, three. I say just a contact open close, but could also be that um, it's a voltage uh, that is being measured on one of those contacts. And I don't want to see a voltage in here, uh, or I will see a voltage uh, on the IO gateway layer, but in the actual uh, graphical interface, I want to see, for instance, a temperature. And I can make a calculation to um, put a formula on the voltage to uh, uh, multiply it and get it into a temperature in Celsius degrees, for instance. So that's uh, something I can do as well in the virtual layer, make it a meaningful uh, parameter or a meaningful unit uh, for the given circumstances. So those are a couple of special elements. Now that I have some elements in my data miner system, I typically want to keep things organized. So I want to give them uh, a little bit uh, a folder structure. It's a little bit like in my uh, file explorer. Um, I will create folders to keep things organized. A little bit like the naming convention, think about a folder structure, uh, make it logical, uh, could be by site, could be by uh, customer or service or type of uh, data sources. Uh, there are various ways. The interesting part of the day, or the interesting uh, thing here in data miner, which is different in a file explorer, is you can put one uh, element into different places. So I can put uh, my um, 
Cisco switch, for instance, in the Amsterdam view, but I can also put it in my um, uh, service uh, delivery view. Um, so I can actually put it in two different views. Uh, so it's not like a document. So it's basically one reference uh, you can put into two different places. Why is it so important to build a good um, view structure? Well, logically to just find your way uh, in your data miner system and to easily get to the correct uh, part of your data miner system, but um, also for uh, security. If I need to be able to give somebody access to my data miner system, uh, but not of my complete system, only of site one, well, then I will need to be able to define what is side one, what, what uh, elements are in there. So if I have in here uh, already my um, uh, view for uh, Chile with uh, the uh, modulators in there, then I can immediately pick that view. So I can easily uh, limit the security based on those views. That's why it's important, um, but also for filtering. If I want to receive uh, critical alarms that are happening in Brazil, uh, then if I just say, okay, view Brazil, severity critical, and I'm done. Uh, so therefore, uh, that's also very important. So think about your view structure, how you want to organize your data miner system. So you can see uh, an example here on the right hand side with my operations, uh, Americas, uh, Brazil, uh, modulators, receivers, uh, some uh, elements in there. Okay, um, now um, I still have redundancy groups and service layers uh, in service layer in this um, video. And then this video is uh, okay for the introduction. Um, the redundancy groups is uh, a special environment. Well, environment, uh, uh, it's where you have um, two primary devices here. I have primary device one and primary device two and I have a backup device standing by. I have some redundancy switching here. Um, if my first encoder, for instance, fails, another one can just immediately take over. So I have two primary devices um, that are available and doing the job effectively and one standing by. But if one of the two primary fails, so if the second uh, one fails here, maybe a satellite receiver, it fails, it can immediately switch over to the backup device. This is a two plus one redundancy group. We can embed that into the data miner system and add that knowledge into the data miner system for any M plus N uh, redundancy group. But let's keep it simple. We have a two plus one. What we will do if you add this knowledge in data miner system, in the data miner system, so we will have the three elements in there, the, the actual elements, uh, two satellite receivers and a backup one. We will next to that create two virtual elements. Virtual elements, they are not immediately pulling the device, as you remember from a few slides back, but they are getting the information somewhere else. Well, actually it's a complete copy under normal circumstances of the primary element one, or if this one would fail, it will actually be a complete copy of the backup element. And the interesting thing is, I can just open up the virtual primary element one, and I don't need to worry if the primary or the backup is doing the job, data miner will figure it out for me and I can just use this element, uh, open it up, do some configuration on it, or check which alarms happened in last week. There will be some alarms from uh, the primary and some of the backup, depending on which one was doing the job. I don't need to worry about that. Data Miner will keep track of that. So in Data Miner, you will define how many primaries, how many backups you have, and when which one is doing the job. And DataMire will nicely create the virtual elements and point you to the correct device doing the job at that point in time, even throughout the history. If I take a look at the trend graph, how a signal evolves, it will be a combination of uh, some trend data or performance data of primary element one or the backup, depending which one is doing the job at which point in time. 
So the redundancy uh, groups allow you to have its own alarm history and things like that. There's some alarm template changes we can do. We can mask the non-operational uh, devices, uh, all of these kind of things. So we can define those uh, switching criteria to define which one is doing the job at which point in time. But what I uh, definitely want to mention here as well is the software redundancy. The software redundancy, um, you have two possible redundancy groups you can add to the data miner system. Either you go for hardware redundancy, basically saying like, okay, the actual switching between the main and the backup is already taken care of by the hardware. Um, there's some logic in there. Whenever something happens, it will uh, uh, switch over to the backup. Then data miner will just uh, show you what the current status is. It will look at the environment and say like, okay, this one is doing the job. That's how I want to represent it in uh, the data miner system so that you're always working with the correct live device. Now, um, there is also a possibility to optionally activate software redundancy. And in that case, you basically say like, yeah, I don't have any hardware redundancy. The equipment is not doing the actual switching. I want data miner to do it. So then the software redundancy, the data miner will do the redundancy switching. And basically data miner will say like, oh, there's a critical problem on my um, main device. It will take the settings. It will uh, copy it to the backup device, reroute a switch uh, to the backup, uh, make your signal uh, to the backup device all automatically. So that's when data miner does the actual switching and configuration to go from the main to the backup. Then we are talking about software redundancy. So it is possible to uh, configure that software redundancy in data miner as well. So remember, um, going one slide back, it is possible that you have those virtual uh, elements. They bring you to the device that is uh, doing the job. And it is like it's one device. It is like uh, the primary and the backup just becomes one and uh, it makes it a lot simpler for the operational uh, environments. One final uh, topic uh, for this uh, data miner introduction is the service layer. Um, the service layer uh, actually adds a layer on top of your equipment. So uh, if you have all your elements, um, sometimes you just have like a bunch of services flowing through a whole bunch of uh, the elements and you don't, you, you more want to take a look at it from that service perspective. So you can add that knowledge to the data miner system and say to the data miner system like, okay, my signal is coming in here. It's flowing through all those different devices, depending on certain conditions that might flow direction A or direction B. Um, there's like a main and a backup pod maybe in there. So all of those, those dynamics can be added in there, uh, not complete devices, but just a part of a device, uh, not the complete Cisco switch, but only one port of that uh, switch I want to uh, include in, in or is important in that service. So you add that whole service layer, uh, that service chain, you could say, into a service layer. And that really allows you to see your data miner system or uh, your environment from a whole new perspective. Because let's take a look uh, here on the right hand side. I have a first scenario on top where I have, um, looking at the elements in my system, I have a bunch of elements. I have one device being down. Okay, that's uh, a critical device uh, or a critical alarm, alarm I have on a device. Um, and I have a second scenario where I have uh, maybe the next day uh, another device uh, in alarm. It seems from a device or element perspective that this is quite similar. Um, here I have one alarm, here I have one critical alarm. Seems quite similar. Well, actually, if I add my service layer on top of that, you will see that in this case, I only have one service that is being impacted uh, in my environment. So only one service that I'm delivering to my customers is impacted by this uh, critical alarm while the second uh, scenario here has a 
way larger impact on my uh, services. There's like a dozen of uh, services that I'm delivering to my customers that are impacted to that. So if I have two of those alarms, critical alarms, I will immediately see the impact of the first scenario as one, the other one is maybe 12. I see that impact and I also see which services are impacted. So if I'm looking at the actual devices, uh, and the alarms on the elements, I will immediately see the impact on the uh, services that I'm providing. But of course, I can also take a look at those services. I can see a list of all the services that I'm delivering, whether they are in a good shape or not. Uh, I can open up my uh, business TV here. I can immediately see which devices are responsible. I can do configuration on it. I can just uh, open up an alarm console and say like, show me all the alarms on business TV that happened in the last week and it will uh, nicely take all the bits and pieces from your data miner system that are relevant uh, that happened in the last week. And note I said dynamic uh, services can be created. So maybe today it's going through part A, maybe tomorrow through part B. So the alarming will only take the alarming when it was effectively impacting your service at that point in time. So that gives you a real nice overview uh, of your services because maybe some equipment uh, and some elements are generating alarm, but they are not effectively in use for a service. Then I don't really worry about it. What I really worry about is the services that I'm currently delivering through my network. So that's what I want to see. That's the impact that uh, I want to see on my uh, interface here. Also, reporting can be done then, of, of course, on the surface layer uh, so that you can see how many alarms, uh, timeline, alarm timelines, things like that uh, can all be uh, generated with that. So that was a little bit of the, an introduction on the data miner system. So we took a look at the general data miner concept. What is data miner about? What's a data miner node? And extending that with several data miner nodes into a data miner system. Uh, a data miner system with a Cassandra cluster and an Elastic cluster for data storage. We took a, a closer look a little bit at some of the more uh, advanced components, functionalities, uh, applications that are available like automation, correlation, session and resource management, just as a quick highlight. Um, and then we started with taking a look like, okay, we have drivers, we have elements, they can generate alarms, we organize them into views, and we also have services and redundancy groups we can add on top of that. So now we have a little bit the building stones, you could say, to start uh, diving into the UI, and that's coming up in the next uh, video with the getting started. Let's take a look at that.